Good. I think we can, we can start. So, after having discussed the relationship between positivistic and natural law theory, the ethics of adjudication and the limits of legal interpretation, we are now going to discuss a paper um, dealing with norms and normativity, or rather, as suggested by the title, with the unbearable heaviness of normativity. Nicola Muffato has been a member of the Girona Legal Philosophy community since September 2009. Before coming to Girona, Nicola studied law at the University of Trieste in Italy, where he graduated in 2005. Between 2006 and 2009, he completed a PhD in legal philosophy at the University of Milan. And, um, um, his publications include uh, a book on the semantics of norms and a more recent book entitled Norme e Discorsi su Norme. So before you begin your talk, uh, I should ask you to limit your presentation at uh, 45 minutes in order to allow us to have the time to discuss uh, your paper. Thanks. Thank you very much. I'm grateful to Andrea, to Giovanni Battista, and to Jordi for having invited me to speak here. And indeed, there are a lot of reasons to be brief. <laughs> First of all, is that I, I don't want to cause sufferance to my audience with my terrible English. In this, I don't know, maybe in the uh, uh, formulation of Professor Finis applies to my case. Is my bad English, a uh, uh, case of English, is, <laughs> and uh, second, I don't want to be boring and heavy as uh, some author conceive uh, norms to be, and uh, also because it's difficult to, to speak after some uh, important professors, like Professor Finnis, Professor Endicott, and a brilliant scholar as uh, Paul Brady. So I will limit myself to a brief presentation of some topics. Uh, indeed, it's also a work in progress, so I, I will be very grateful for your comments in the discussion. I try to present uh, uh, the main uh, themes of my exposition as, I, as if I was, uh, were telling a story. Uh, but uh, before telling the story, I, I'd like to sketch some, uh, to present some classical distinction in uh, analytical uh, philosophy. And this distinction, uh, as you can see from uh, the abstract and from uh, the endowed, uh, are relative to uh, the intention extension uh, opposition um, concerning two dimension of meaning, uh, the separation, the um, trichotomy between uh, uh, token types and occurrences, and then uh, uh, another separation which uh, uh, trace uh, a dividing line between uh, ideal entities and uh, concepts. I, I think that uh, abstractions are kind of concepts. So to begin with uh, uh, the extension, intention, distinction. Uh, as you can see, um, uh, I uh, proposed a, a classical scheme uh, which uh, uh, identifies um, the extension of a concept as a collection of uh, individuals that follows under the concept, while uh, the intention of the concept is the property or the properties uh, um, ascribed to the individuals follows, follow, um, falling under that concept. This is uh, the classical distinction. Of course, we can uh, ascribe intentionality and, and extensionality not, not, all, uh, not only to sentences, but also to predicates and to singular terms and to sets. So we have uh, much, uh, much oppositions. 
that is, uh, we can describe sets as collection or as classes. Uh, we can des describe singular terms as individuals or as individual concepts. We can describe predicates as collection of uh, individuals, individuals or ordered entiples. Or we can describe predicates as properties or any relations. Uh, last but not least, we can describe sentences, the, the dimensions of the meaning of sentences, as uh, extensionally as uh, uh, truth values or as propositions. But I will uh, I will uh, come back on on this uh, on this theme. The second uh, uh, distinction I'd like to draw um, is uh, that between concept. Uh, abstraction and ideal entities. Uh, let's start from uh, uh, the notion of, uh, of ideal entity. I believe this, uh, this notion is an ontological one. Uh, ideal entities are traditionally conceived as a temporal, uncreated, and unchangeable, independently existing uh, objects but real in a strong sense, in the sense that um, are real uh, objects like a bottle of water, for example. I said that uh, um, ideal entities are real, but the concepts of uh, time and space usually do not apply to ideal entities. I think, um, as, as an example, uh, to um, uh, Platonism, uh, as a conception of uh, ideal entities. Well, um, while uh, uh, realism and idealism affirm the existence of ideal entities, nominalism denies. It's a, a conception that denies the existence of ideal entities. Uh, the more, probably the most famous uh, uh, defender of nominalism is uh, Guglielmo d'Occam, William, uh, William of Ockham, uh, who uh, proposed his famous uh, Ockham razors, uh, that is, entia non sum, non sum multiplicanda preter necessitatem, which has also a semiotic version proposed by Paul Grice that says that senses are not to be multiply, multiplied beyond necessity. I will turn later on this, uh, on this topic. On the other hand, we have concepts. Uh, concept, I think, it's not an ontological, but an epistemological or semiotic notion. The two aspects I, um, are, in my, opinion, in my opinion, interrelated. Concepts are not entities, nor a fortiori discrete entities. Um, we can probably conceive them as processes, processes implicit in uh, what we perceive, in what we do, in what we think, and um, more important, in what we linguistically express. Uh, an important feature of um, concept talk is that existent talk doesn't properly apply to concept. Because existing, existence is not a property. So it's not a semiotic property, nor an epistemological property. While I, uh, ideal entities uh, are eternal and atemporal, um, ex uh, we can say that time and space um, attribution do not, apply, do not properly apply to ideal entities. Concepts have a history. The, the, the very notions of time and of space probably apply to concepts, in particular that of time. Uh, Concepts have a history in the sense that they could be modified by our use. Uh, I put uh, in my presentation an example from uh, uh, William Clancy, which is um, a researcher in um, cognitive science at the NASA who uh, says that, for example, the meaning of planet is changing 
As we are, I, I'm citing, uh, as we are discovering remote spherical objects uh, between the size of 10, Jupi 10 times Jupiter and brown dwarf stars, the very idea, uh, read uh, the concept, uh, of planet is changing. Must the planet uh, revolve around a star? If a planet is a source of heat, like Jupiter, then how is it different from a star? Could a planet be much larger than any other planet in our solar system? Could stars develop into planets? These questions, says uh, Clancy, involve causal stories and blended classification, changing meaning relative to each other. So we can, uh, we can say that um, there is a, a strong asymmetry between uh, our con our, the classical conception of meaning entities and this uh, history about concept. I think that abstraction can be conceived uh, as a kind of concept, abstract concept. Um, in general, uh, we, can see, we can say that uh, um, uh, abstraction are uh, concepts um, regarding some specific features of uh, individuals or collection of individuals. And uh, these features are considered relevant, in some case uh, even necessary, and isolated by taking away. Uh, indeed, uh, the very uh, Latin word uh, abstraere uh, means uh, exactly to take away from. It's a taking, an abstraction is a taking away of some circumstantial accidental aspects uh, of uh, um, a phenomena, for example. And a relevant feature of abstraction is that the, they are fundamental in the construction of logical vocabulary. The third distinction I'd like to draw is uh, a distinction between type, tokens, and occurrences. This maybe is the more problematic of this, uh, this tentative distinction. Uh, because it involves some problems in the exegesis of, uh, of uh, pairs, and uh, I think that uh, we cannot separate roughly uh, these concepts from uh, uh, the whole context of Peirce's discussion, but probably we can try to, with, with a, a forced operation, to, to use this concept outside this, con this context. Well, types uh, can be seen as abstract standards, that is to say, as rules as rules to which uh, individual instances have to conform. Uh, as, as the same uh, Peirce says, uh, types do not uh, exist. A type does not exist. It only determinates things that do exist. These seem to um, accord, uh, to agree uh, with our concept of abstraction that I presented uh, uh, before. On the other hand, tokens, uh, which in the semiotic vocabulary of uh, pairs are also presented as active signs or seen signs, are concrete particular instances, facts, entities, objects, or events, with a unique spatio-temporal dimension, space-temporal dimension, or location. A token consists in the application uh, or fulfillment of a standard, of a rule, of a type. To be a token, normally, uh, an, instant, an instance must uh, reproduce a type, but this is uh, another problematic uh, issue. Let's now distinguish occurrences from tokens. Token uh, occurrences are uh, abstract instances of complex types, which can be seen as uh, 
expressions, uh, expressions uh, plans or as sequences. In fact, the need, uh, the very need to distinguish tokens and occurrences can be appreciated uh, whenever we consider a complex type including other simpler times uh, occurring in it. For example, the type of the flag uh, Old Glory includes 50 occurrences of the type of a five-pointed star. Not however that uh, another, um, an abstract complex time may be a sequence of concrete individuals. As, for example, when I say that uh, uh, in the sequence of New Jersey million dollars lottery winners, the same individual, the same concrete person, occurs twice. It's a quite uh, strange case. So with this uh, row of um, instruments, let's try to investigate something about normativity. As I promised, now I tell you the story of <laughs> um, that, uh, uh, let's say, ontological distinction presented by Alciuro and Bulligi. Alciuro and Bulligi started to uh, study this problem because they have uh, uh, some uh, logical troubles uh, concerning the application of logic to norms. So they uh, try to formalize in different ways this, uh, in logical vocabulary, this problem, and uh, they uh, ended uh, considering that this logical problem has probably an ontological and semiotical uh, basis. So they distinguish two conceptions of norms, two conceptions. Probably presenting these two conceptions as mutually exclusive and jointly exhaustive. This is uh, probably one can argue this, uh, this conclusion um, interpreting two free texts. The main text is the expression of the conception of norms, but there are also some observation in Pragmatic Foundation for a Logic of Norms and uh, in another paper, um, if I'm correct, uh, on Weinberger and Kelsen ontology of norms. So we can try to reconstruct uh, their think, um, their, 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 their uh, ideas basing on these three uh, texts. These two conception of norms are called by uh, Alcioran Bulligin hyletic conception, hyletic conception, and uh, expressive conception. Uh, I don't know the reasons uh, that moved uh, Alcioran Bulligin in the choice of the term hyletic. I have some perplexity because the term ile in Greek uh, language means matter uh, rather than ideal. Than, uh, it's a term which is opposed, for example, in Husserl vocabulary to morphe. Uh, ile is the raw matter to which intentional, the intentional activities of the subject uh, project. So, I don't know, probably uh, another, another term would help us to make much more clear, the, more clear their, this distinction, but anyway. Uh, according to the electric conception, norms are proposition-like entities. Proposition-like entities which, uh, in, uh, according to Alciuroni and Bulligin, are um, abstract and uh, can, can be uh, conceived as purely conceptual. Anyway, uh, as the author said, uh, an eletic norm is independent from language. Have, uh, eletic norms have an independent existence. This seems to me to conflate 
our uh, earlier distinction between ideal entities and concepts. They seem to conflate these two characterizations. A norm is a prescriptive meaning entity, a proposition-like entity, said the authors, not susceptible of true truth and falsity. Uh, one can, uh, this can lead us to suspect that the very uh, label proposition-like entity is a metaphor. But if it is a metaphor, it's a quite misleading metaphor because it, her, uh, it has some uh, important and dangerous bearings on uh, other aspects of their theory. And I try to sketch briefly how this aspect in uh, the following points. Uh, the expressive conception, instead, uh, says that norms are the result of prescriptive speech acts, of a prescriptive use of language. This time, uh, we are speaking of results, but uh, I'm not sure that uh, this result have to be conceived as objects. Uh, indeed, we can probably say that this is another metaphor that um, Alchuron and Buligin probably wanted to say that uh, in, uh, according to the expressive conception, conception, the pragmatic dimension of analysis is more important than the semantic dimension of analysis. So if eletic conception bears on the dimension of meaning, of uh, you know, uh, focuses on the semantic dimensions, uh, the expressive conception pays more attention to the pragmatic aspects of communication. Well, let's now uh, take a look to uh, some uh, uh, relations between the the two, um, the two conception. First of all, uh, we have to try to, uh, to solve this ambiguity between the possibility to conceive uh, eletic conception as uh, eletic norms as meaning entities or as meaning abstractions. And the same thing we can say, we can say about the uh, expressive conception, conception, because if the expressive conception uh, relies on a distinction between the force of an expression and its meaning, probably we have to consider the aspect of meaning in the same way we divided the, uh, the eletic norms in two possibilities in uh, uh, considering proposition, proposition and norm in the eletic norms as abstraction or as ideal entities. So in this sense, we have to opt for nominalism or for realism. This is uh, our, uh, our choice we are called to, to, uh, to make. These problems affecting uh, the ontological sphere, the semantic, semiotic, pragmatic spheres have important consequences when we have to formalize in a logical language the structure of a norm. Eletic conception uh, thinks that um, yeah, presents uh, the logical structure of a norm by using the deontic mo modalization, uh, the modalities uh, of obligation, permission, prohibition, indifference applied to propositional contents. The classical form is OP, where O means obligatory, and P meaning, means the propositional content. While the expressive conception applies not modal operators as 
the ONTIC model operators as obligation, permission, and the like, but uh, indicators of the force of the expression. These are not functional operators. Um, the, these operators uh, do not make any contribution to the semantic content of uh, the sentence, of a sentence, for example. So this generates a series of uh, prob problems, problems to, uh, concerning uh, the possibility of build, build logical relations between uh, uh, between uh, norms and uh, propositions. Let's uh, take stock for uh, a while. Um, for the expressive conception, as I said, um, a norm, an expressive norm, is to be represented by um, an operator which is uh, an, uh, a force indicator, a pragmatic indicator. While uh, according to uh, Alturan and Bulligan reconstruction of uh, expressive conception, the propositional part, which is often indicated with uh, the letter P, is a full-fledged proposition. Now, are we to conceive this full-fledged proposition as a truth bearer or not? Er um, as a complete indicative uh, sentential uh, device which is apt to express a sentence, a complete sentence, or not? Or is a syntagmatic expression, an expression which um, explores and expresses only the dimension of reference? This is uh, an important uh, problem because then uh, we have to opt from, for one of these two alternatives. Now, uh, Altura and Bulligan also said that uh, while uh, elitic conception uh, presents uh, elitic norm as operations on propositions, expressive conception presents expressive norms as a special use of proposition. So we have to distinguish an operation on proposition uh, from a uh, specific pragmatic use of proposition. I propose to interpret the term operation as a logical term, not as a pragmatic expression. Still, uh, this point uh, apart, mm, we are faced with, uh, mm, with uh, a problem which is, uh, as I briefly said uh, before, parallel to the problem faced by eletheists. That is to say, uh, shall we, are we pragmatically using meaning entities or meaning abstractions when we are uh, talking about proposition. Well, a nominalist defender of expressivism would probably urge that uh, uh, since normal language dependent, their propositional content cannot be an ideal, an, an ideal meaning entity. But expressive norms are not simple propositions. They are results of a particular use of proposition. So, uh, probably a realist uh, might object, why couldn't we use in speech ideal meaning entities? Well, this problem is uh, related to, uh, to the question about how, uh, if ever, norms start or stop existing uh, according to expressive conception. Well, depending on what version of this conception we adopt, we can mm, discriminate uh, a series of solutions. For example, let, let's take uh, uh, eletics, eletic conception. According to eletic conception, norms are meaning entities. That is, 
if we take an uh, idealist, uh, uh, realist sense, uh, a temporal and dot created ideal entities. They do not start and nor stop existing. Uh, although it seems that we can distinguish between merely possible and really existent norms, as uh, Otto Weinberger does, from uh, the point of view of the ideal entities, this alleged difference is quite implausible. So I think that uh, Weinberger reconstruction of uh, eletic conception is at odds with a realist stance on meaning entities. On the other hand, expressive norms are the results depend on a special use of language, namely of a happy and successful prescriptive speech act performed at a certain time t and in a certain place s. Nonetheless, this very definition is open to two alternative interpretations. That is, one, can, one may conceive expressive norms in terms of ideal meaning entities, creation, that is, proposition creation, but this openly contradicts the above sketched notion of meaning entities as a temporal and uncreated entities. Indeed, how can a fact, an institutional fact, make an ideal object exist? Ricardo Caracciolo rightly pointed out that this problem is due to an illegitimate substitution. A substitution uh, due to the fact that the expressivist identifies the possibility of a norm with the po uh, possibility of an institutional fact, namely performing a, prescript a prescriptive speech act. The other possible interpretation is uh, the sequence, one may conceive uh, the following, one may conceive uh, uh, expressive, concept, uh, expressive norms in terms of ideal meaning entities. Ideal meaning entities use, propositions use. But this solution doesn't commit the expressivist to reject the possibility of some relation between norms and facts. Indeed, the expressivist could and may establish membership criteria referring to these very facts in order to form set of propositions contingently used with prescriptive force. For example, we could say that a certain proposition P belongs to a certain system S in virtue of its having been used on certain occasion T and by the subject X to perform certain prescriptive speech act K. Note that this strategy doesn't amount to treat uh, norm as facts. Expressivists merely use fact-referring criteria as constitutive of the intentional relation of membership. So the main trouble with this, uh, with this interpretation, with this conception, is that we have to explain how is it possible to use a non-empirical entity, an ideal entity? Then we have a third option, a third solution, that is to conceive expressive norms as institutional facts. But in this case, uh, probably we wouldn't have to use uh, uh, the term result to refer to expressive norms. The intentional equation between uh, norms and institutional facts uh, allows the expressivist applying to norms time, space, causal, and probably also pedigree relation, but only at the cost of generating uh, some kind of dilemma. Indeed, I think that is not a real dilemma, as I try to show later, but we can present it as a, as a dilemma. But since an institutional fact is a brute fact qualified by a norm which sets specific correctness condition of subsumption, 
we can correctly apply the concept of a norm only to those facts that meet the condition imposed by a norm. But this makes our definition of norm either circular, norm is a fact qualified by a norm, either open to infinite regress. Norm is a fact qualified by a second order norm. Why I think that this is not a genuine dilemma? Because I think that the term norm in the two sides of the equation doesn't uh, maintain the same meaning. So these are the principal problems with uh, uh, this free uh, interpretation. Well, we have fourth and the fifth, if in the fifth uh, possible interpretation of elliptic and expressive norm. According to the fourth interpretation, elliptic norms are meaning abstraction, abstraction from concrete prescriptive speech X. While on the fifth interpretation, expressive norms are the results of a special use, of a prescriptive use of meaning abstraction. Well, I think that uh, option four calls for an interpretation of prescriptive use, while fifth, uh, well, five, five uh, option is clearly circular, because it relies on pragmatic criteria to distinguish norms from uh, propositions. So uh, let's uh, uh, leave for a second apart this, uh, aside these troubles. And concent let's concentrate on the meaning of the term proposition. Is proposition to be conceived as a kind of meaning, a meaning entity, a meaning abstraction, or as an instance of a rule of meaning? If we say that the meaning of an expression is determined by norms, is rule governed, we have to distinguish between instances of this rule, uh, rule following, and proposition or meanings as abstraction from concrete speech X. So we have to uh, take uh, a clear, uh, clear uh, solution. Uh, we have to adopt a, a choice. We have to choose between two conceptions of meaning, of meaning entities, of proposition, and of elliptic norms. We have to say either there are instances of rule following, that is, following rules of meaning, either they are meaning abstraction. This seems to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, involve the distinction between type, tokens, and occurrences. In other words, we have to choose if meaning entities, meaning uh, proposition considered meaning uh, entities, are to be considered as instances of a type or as types. Well, this is the last uh, one of the main troubles I want to uh, indicate uh, regarding the uh, elliptic expressive uh, distinction. There are many others, but I, I will limit myself to, to this uh, that I mentioned. This is the destruence part. It's not very destruence, it's more, uh, it's more a deconstruction of uh, the uh, elliptic expressive uh, dichotomy. And so in, now I will try to propose an alternative scheme, an alternative uh, uh, paradigm of analysis. Indeed, it seems that uh, Alcuro and Bulligin assume that uh, the meaning of an expression is something different from its use. 
they seem, they seem to assume that the meaning of uh, an expression uh, consists in its truth conditions. But, of course, there is another uh, important uh, stream in uh, analytical philosophy of language that conceives the meaning as the inferential role that uh, an expression or a substantial expression can play in an inferential reasoning, in, in articulated uh, reasoning structure in inferential terms, uh, articulated in inferential terms. Um, this uh, alternative paradigm of analysis involves the concepts of commitment and entitlement. Those familiars with uh, Brandom um, making it explicitly uh, will surely uh, recognize the main uh, topics to which uh, I refer. So let's now try to develop uh, an alternative uh, paradigm. We can say that there are in one sense, norms are prescriptive speech acts. That is, speech acts that are used to make the audience, the uh, uh, other part of the meaning of the communicative relation, do something. Um, it is some sort of a relation of guidance. Uh, the subject which issues the prescription wants to guide the conduct, uh, the behavior of the other part. This is a communicative relation which can probably be explained in conventional terms. That is, uh, we can uh, try to uh, interpret uh, the intentions of the speaker as uh, um, series of uh, uh, sneak intention, that is to say, the subject which, uh, who issues the prescription intended that the uh, audience interpret his intention as a reason to do what he prescribed in virtue of this very reason. It's uh, a virtuous circularity in Grice's explanation. And this is probably one plausible conception of norms which relies on the concepts of intentions. Uh, but no, not only on the concepts of intention, because it invokes uh, also the concepts of commitment, in the sense that a meaning expression, a sentence, for example, has to be interpreted as a prescription, even if the um, uh, issue of uh, the subject which, uh, who issues uh, the prescription indeed doesn't actually have the, this very intention. We have to consider not the actual intention but the internal intention which is necessary to reconstruct the, the dynamic of the communication. This is uh, one sort of uh, reconstruction of uh, the concept of norm. An alternative, uh, an alternative concept, which I call the uh, deontic judgment, uh, um, recalling a distinction from uh, uh, Bayon and from uh, as, uh, Nino, is that uh, that concerns uh, that conceives um, norms as assessments of correctness of actions. That is to say, these assessments need not to be conceived as p-checks, need not to be expressed as p-checks, but they are presupposed in uh, the very concepts of p-checks. Last but not, le but not least is uh, the concept of implicit norm, of commitment, which I uh, referred uh, before. An implicit norm is a norm implicit in the practice of issuing and ordering, of promising, in, in, um, 
there are a lot of different uh, kinds of commitments, uh, epistemic, doxastic commitments. Uh, there are deontic commitments uh, in, uh, in the prescriptive uh, speech, act, speech act practice. But uh, in, uh, in general, we can say that these implicit norms regard uh, concern the very possibility of uh, conceive a practice. Uh, here I'm uh, referring in particular to uh, the um, uh, paradox of interpretations of Wittgenstein, uh, which uh, Professor um, Endicott uh, uh, explained above in surely better terms than I. Um, if uh, I have to follow a rule, I cannot uh, use an interpretation of that rule as a criteria to establish what, what is and what is not a correct instance of following that rule, because this will generate an, a regress regarding the rule that governs the interpretation of the first rule. So I have to rely on implicit norms, conceptual objective norms, implicit in the practice, that will guide my uh, assessment of correctness. So these are three elements to reconstruct normative practice. They are, um, these are three uh, independent but interrelated elements because prescriptive norms as prescriptive speech checks need to uh, be based on the very concept of the antique judgment which is an assessment of correctness of actions independent from the expression of uh, the very expression of speech act and from the idea of implicit norms. Implicit norms can be conceived in two different ways and this is a um, bifurcation, a dichotomy um, to explore. I, I, don't have, I don't claim to have uh, uh, precise idea regarding this uh, topic, um, I limit myself to present these two uh, options. An implicit norm can be conceived as a constitutive rule in the Searle's sense, that is to say a rule that can be presented in the form X, X counts as epsilon in the count, in the context C, or a regulative, or as a regulative rule. That is a rule that governs a pre-existing pre action not constituted by that very rule. So we have these options. Uh, the most important thing is that these rules cannot uh, be explicit rules, because if they were uh, explicit rules, then we have the regress argument uh, of uh, the uh, interpretation of the rules of uh, Wittgenstein argument operating. So this is probably um, the, the most striking uh, uh, problem of uh, this uh, uh, alternative conception, opting for a conception of implicit norm as con constitutive rules or as regulative rules. That is to say, interpret rules of meaning as prescription, as regulative rules, or as constitutive rules. I don't, uh, uh, I, I will not uh, opt for one uh, of the two horns of the dilemma now. And uh, I hope to make uh, clearer my thought uh, uh, in contesting to, to your uh, question in the debate that I, I, I leave uh, now uh, uh, open the space to the debate if you if you agree thank you very much oh.